Let's go to the next part um, on Ukraine. There's some big, important developments that have been happening in the Ukraine conflict. One of them, of course, was uh, the Ukrainian presumptive Ukrainian strikes on Russian territory on Moscow um, that ended up going uh, into residential areas, coming after a second attack on the Kremlin itself. The White House press corps asked the Biden administration, uh, hey, are you guys cool with our allied, supposed allied government striking Russia um, and residential areas and potentially even with U.S. equipment after they pr pr uh, promised that they would never do so when you provided them with F-16s? And she didn't have a real answer. Here's what she had to say. Does the president believe that Ukraine risks losing the moral high ground in this conflict if it strikes at potentially civilian targets in Moscow? So look, I'm going to be very clear. We're gathering information. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals uh, from here. Uh, we do not support the use of uh, U.S.-made equipment being used uh, for attacks inside of Russia. We've been very clear about that. Oh, we've been very clear about that. Uh, we don't support it. We're still gathering. But here's the issue. The U.S. is not the only one who's involved in this conflict. And in fact, our so-called cousins, I guess, across the Atlantic, uh, if you think our press and our country is crazy about Ukraine, as I found out while I was over there, you, we got nothing um, on the U.K. Put this up there on the screen because it includes an important quote from the British Foreign Secretary, so effectively their Secretary of State, James Cleverly. He says, quote, Ukraine has the right to project force beyond its borders. And also a spokesperson for the German government said that international law, of course, allowed Ukraine to to strike Russian territory in self-defense, but then added that Berlin opposed the use of German weapons for such attacks. The Brits actually did not use the qualifier that they shouldn't use theirs. And this is why it's so messy. No one is saying that they don't have the right to project force beyond their borders, which is what you know cleverly seems to be using this as. And no one is saying that. You can do whatever you want. Now, the idea, though, that you should do whatever you want with the stuff that we give you is a whole other conversation. And actually, just this morning, Crystal, ironically, in the Washington Post, they published a story, which is, you know, people are already freaking out about because it just tells the truth. Quote, Biden shows growing appetite to cross Putin's red lines. And here's what I love. Here is how Amer uh, the U.S. defense policymakers uh, put, put aside, like, uh, problems with red lines. U.S. officials say the dynamic a uh, reason for brushing aside the threats is that since the opening doors of the war, Russia's president has not followed through on promises to punish the West for providing weapons to Ukraine. His bluffing has given U.S. and European leaders some confidence they can continue doing so without severe consequences. But to what extent remains one of the most dangerous uncertainties? So basically their argument is, well, they haven't done anything yet. So we'll just keep upping the ante and giving the Ukrainians whatever they want. I will once again remind everyone that we are literally openly crossing Putin's red lines and all of this. Maybe that's worth it whenever Texas is at stake or a real ally like NATO or any of these other people. We're talking about the Eastern Donbass region of Ukraine. In what world does it make sense to potentially drag us into a world war by Biden's own word, like not my words, his words, over a scrap of territory in a place we have no formal agreement with and literally has zero importance to the global economy. This does not mean that I am not have do not have deep empathy for the people who live in that region, who have been flattened, who have been killed, for all the soldiers and for all the people in Ukraine who've been unjustly bombed and been killed by the Russian machine. That does not mean that, that we should then put ourselves, though, in a place where we need to risk our own national security um, over this you know, area of the globe. It's, these are basic cost-benefit analyses, which only you know, are, uh, make sense to people, Crystal, when you start using terms like democracy or, or you know, autocracy versus democracy, when we forget that one of the places that was invaded is one of the most corrupt countries on planet Earth, invaded, by the way, by one of the other most corrupt countries on planet Earth. I mean, yeah. we're using Ukraine as a pawn in our great power game. It's ridiculous. That's what we're doing. It has nothing to do with the sanctity of right. democracy or, you know, national sovereignty or any, or our love for Zelensky or anything right. like that. It's, we see an opportunity to weaken a country that has been a rival, um, still have this like Cold War mentality baked in there. Um, we're fearful of their alliance with China. Um, we don't like Putin. He doesn't, you know, cede to our wishes and, you know, he's gone rogue since we like handpicked him for the job, yeah. by the way, originally. Um, and so they see it as an opportunity to push him out and they're using Ukrainian lives as like, you know, fodder for our war games. Um, I think it is 
disgraceful that I, I don't agree that Ukraine has a right to just do whatever they want because you're talking about targeting residential civilian buildings, and I don't think that that's acceptable. I mean, it's in, a war, right? in any instance, I don't think it's acceptable. I don't think it's acceptable when Russia does it. I don't think it's acceptable when we do it. You know, these are regular Russian people who you know didn't start this war, and some of them may be adamantly opposed to it. So you know, it's the same thing as saying like we'd be fair game because of our like individual civilians in America would be fair game because we started the war in Iraq. So I, I don't accept that framing. But, you know, do I understand certainly the idea of like Ukraine projecting them and doing everything they can to win the war on their own? Of course, right? That doesn't mean that our interests coincide with theirs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's not incredibly risky and dangerous escalation. And if you're Russia looking at our reaction to the targeting of residential apartment buildings in downtown Moscow, and we can't be bothered to even like come close to connect, we say this theoretical, oh, we told them not to use our weapons for these strikes. Yeah, you're gonna just be furthered in your belief that this is in fact a proxy war and that we are in many ways enabling these types of attacks on their soil. I mean, not in many ways, we effectively are enabling these types of attacks on their soil. And it's also very likely to harden the Russian population and make them more committed to the war effort and willing to sustain and endure more uh, hardship and you know difficulties in order to be successful. So um, you can see that uh, the, the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, he told reporters Russia would have preferred to hear at least some words of condemnation and said, we will calmly and deliberately think how to deal with this. I also always just reject this idea that's floated in the Washington Post and by the Biden administration that like, oh, Russia hasn't responded. I, I don't think that's true. I think they have responded. I think they have escalated. They did a draft. They've continued to expand operations. They've you know stepped up their bombing of Kyiv, which is horrific for the people that live there. So, and they have just recently started talking again about nukes. Some of that talk had sort of like faded away. Now it's getting back into the official statements. And I think we, even if there's a tiny, tiny, tiny percent chance that, you know, that's a possibility. It's something we have to take deadly seriously. Of course you have to take it seriously. These people have, once again, these people have nuclear weapons and everyone's like, oh, you're supposed to just back down. I mean, no, whenever we're talking about, again, Berlin, well, yes, maybe when we're talking about a scrap that literally has no effect on any of our lives here whatsoever. And look at the way, the, this is Medvedev, put this up there on the screen. He was supposed to be the reasonable one. Look at the way that these people are talking now. They've gone nuts. He says the UK's foreign secretary cleverly has stated Ukraine is legitimate right to project force. According to him, legitimate military beyond yeah, t military targets beyond Ukraine's borders are part of its self-defense. The goofy officials of the UK are, quote, eternal enemies should remember that within the framework of the universally accepted international law of which they, of course, ignore, their state can also be qualified as being at war. Today, the UK acts as Ukraine's ally, providing it with military aid in the form of equipment and specialists de facto is leading an undeclared war against Russia. That being the case, any of its public officials who facilitate the war can be considered as a legitimate military target. I mean, basically openly threatening assassination and, you know, death. I mean, wow. look, this is scary stuff. And, you know, people will say, oh, well, he said it before. Yeah, yeah, I said it before. Maybe you say it 15 times on the 16th time that you're, you're right. And the risk of being right on the, or uh, the risk of being real on the 16th time, so high that you should probably just do everything in your power to make sure that it doesn't happen and that you only breach and get up to this point whenever it's actually worth it. Um, you know, and I guess Ilhan Omar, who has had a very strange, I guess, relationship with Ukraine war, she's anti-war, but then on Ukraine, she's not saying much. Uh, she was confronted by a reporter, Liam Cosgrove, uh, yesterday on Capitol Hill and said, hey, if what are you willing to reconsider at least your support for Ukraine if they're going to be bombing, um, you know, targets inside of Russia? Here's what she had to say. If there is um, escalation where um, Ukraine is now fighting inside of Russia and causing um, lives to be lost in, in that regard, then, you know, we, we would have to make a different calculation. I got some comments from Jerry Nadler last week, and he said kind of the opposite. He said he personally wouldn't care if they do attack Russia with our weapons. Um, so you disagree with him on that? Oh, certainly. Uh, I, I think, you know, for me, my support um, for Ukraine has always been to preserve lives. Uh, for them to be able to have the resources that they need uh, to minimize the number of people that were being killed um, because Russia invaded. And, 
you know, in, in that space, I, I only want people in battle to be heard. So if, if there are um, uh, Ukrainians that are now uh, attacking Russians in Russia, um, that changes the calculation. And so last question for you, w- would this change your decision on continued support, continued funding and military support? I would have to learn more, but certainly it does change my calculation in the way that I think about supporting sovereignty and uh, preserving lives. I interesting mean, comments. Interesting. I, listen, I, I think she deserves well-earned criticism for supposedly being anti-war and then shipping and voting for weapons to Ukraine and all this. But you got to give credit where it is due, at least willing to come out and say it whenever it's out there. And uh, credit to the guy also well, for asking. Her. And let me say, yeah. you know, I think the calculation on these things is difficult because especially the early packages of aid. I mean, I supported some of the early packages of aid when you're talking about you know, Russia invades them, it's an illegal war, they're trying to defend themselves. Like, that's a very sympathetic cause. And one that someone who is anti-war could genuinely support. When you get to this point, and you've had the Biden administration really clearly spell out that this isn't about just Ukrainian sovereignty, Mm -hmm. this is about let's try to topple the Putin regime. When you've had, not just this instance, you've had multiple instances of the Ukrainians attacking Russians on Russian soil and, you know, increasingly brazen strikes, including one on the Kremlin that, you know, it was sort of like a, a rather pathetic attempt at an assassination if it was. But still, you're, t- you're striking the Kremlin like that is pretty wild. Um, that should, at the very least, cause people to pause and reconsider their calculations. What I want to say is, you know, I wish more journalists were pressing politicians in this way and framing it in this regard. In almost every instance, they're getting pushed from the other perspective, where it's like, why didn't you send the F-16 sooner? Mm -hmm. And what about, you know, what about the no-fly zone or whatever? It's usually, it's always pushing in the other direction. So it's nice to see a journalist who is framing questions in this way and pushing in the other direction of what about, you know, I'd love to see more, what about diplomacy? Remember when Ryan asked a question about diplomacy? He was like the only one in the White House press briefing room who ever asked a question about, hey, what can we do to enable diplomacy here? We need a whole lot of that because ultimately, you know, if you get politicians on the record and you uh, force them to sort of grapple with what their positions are and how they align or misalign with their stated principles, it can be a powerful force. I agree. Uh, give, shout out to him. Liam Cosgrove is his name. You guys should go follow him on Twitter. Uh, he's done a couple of good things. He I think he also, before. he got those comments from Jerry Nadler. He did. Too, right? He also yeah. got the comments from Nadler. So, hey, you know, we support. He also asked uh, the State Department an interesting question as well. So go go uh, throw him a follow. We like to support um, people who are doing interesting work, stuff like that here. Hey, guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.